Hello and welcome to the first Fund Insider interview in our new recording studio. I'm Kyle Caldwell, the Collectives Editor at Interact Investor, and today I'm joined by Simon Edelston, who is the Fund Manager of the Midwind International Investment Trust. Simon, thanks for coming in today. You're welcome. So Simon, the Trust invests in high quality stocks that are centred around a certain investment theme. Could you run through a couple of the investment themes in the portfolio at the moment? Yeah, that's fine. So the, the two key words there for us are quality and, um, and as you say, the themes, which basically means growth themes. Uh, we invest around the world, so um, we have an enormous range of stocks to pick from and sectors to pick from. So basically, we, we avoid sectors we think are in long term decline, such as the oil sector, having a very good time at the moment as, as we speak. Unfortunately, in the, in the middle of this uh, Ukraine uh, war, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, so the oil price has gone up. Um, but that wouldn't make us invest in oil. We think oil is long term dying as an industry. Um, on the other hand, uh, it seems to us fairly straightforward that sectors such as automation have a very good future. Um, and so that, that's quite a large part of our portfolio, even though, oddly enough, um, automation orders are very, very strong, um, but not all of those orders are being fulfilled because at the moment China in particular is, is unable to take delivery. But we know that there's a really good long term theme there. So we have over 10 percent of the fund's assets in that theme. Uh, hopefully that's a good example. And with high quality stocks, how do you ensure that you're not overpaying for the company? Yeah, so valuation, to our mind, has always been important, but even more important in the current market environment. Uh, so one thing that's rather tripped people up is that high growth stocks, to our mind, became very expensive last year. Uh, they'd done extremely well over the previous 12 years of bull market, fantastically well, in fact, particularly American internet stocks. Uh, but at any point in time, we always want to feel that there's a good level of safety owning a share in terms of its underlying cash flow. So what we do is we, we try to work out exactly how much cash the company is producing for shareholders, compare it with the share price and make sure that there's still good value for money there. And we just didn't think there was. And so last year, we reduced our exposure to the highest growth parts of our portfolio by about 10 percent. And we bought other quality stocks, but on much, much lower valuations against current cash flow. And that's given the fund good balance. It's protected it against some of the falls that you've seen in the market in the last three months. Could you give a couple of stock examples of companies that you, you bought towards the end of last year? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, a, a, a good example might be we sold a company like PayPal this time last year. Um, very good business, not growing quite as quickly as people expected. I think the shares have fallen. 30% or something, perhaps more than that since we sold it. But, but that was on a P, goodness me, if you tried to do an earnings multiple, it'd be right up in the sort of 60s or 70s, something like that. Going to grow very quickly, but already discounting a lot of it. We moved the money into companies which we still think, think have very high quality, i.e. high barriers to entry, very profitable, but which don't grow very quickly, such as, uh, I think we bought uh, Nippon Telecom. Now, Nippon Telecom, biggest phone company in Japan, trades on about nine times earnings, it has a yield even in yen of, of um, uh, over three and a half percent. Japanese companies typically yield less than one percent. So, you know, it's, it's already very profitable. Uh, and that sort of defensive investment has done quite well as, as markets become more worried about the future. A part of the portfolio is invested in companies that you call cockroaches. Uh, stocks that can survive disaster. Could you name a couple of examples of such companies and how much of the portfolio is in these names? Yeah, so Nippon Telecom is, is a great example of a cockroach. Doesn't grow very quickly, but you know the famous thing about cockroaches is that they're the, the only life form which will survive a nuclear war. So perhaps um, particularly pertinent today without hopefully being too trivial about it. But you, there are times like this where the economy is under a lot of pressure um, there's a lot of inflation about. And so companies that can pass on inflation, companies that can cope with but perhaps um, slowing economies, because as interest rates rise this year, it's quite likely that the economic recovery we'd all hoped for after the pandemic actually proves to be a bit, bit of a damp squib. And, so, uh, and, and on top of that, companies will be facing inputs uh, inflation and the public will be facing, is already facing, uh, quite a squeeze in the cost of living. 
So these companies which are defensive, which can pass on inflation and which trade on very low valuations compared with the growth stocks have a role in the portfolio. So we bought Nippon Telecom, we, bought, we own some American railroads. Um, companies like that now make up about 15% of the portfolio. You don't need that much, but you need enough to balance the growth stocks that you're holding for the long term. And is that 15% um, like a typical level or is that increased in light of the Russia-Ukraine um, conflict? And in regards to Russia and Ukraine, do you have any direct or indirect exposure to those countries? Yeah, so the 15% uh, hasn't gone up. Well, it's gone up because their stocks have gone up, but we haven't bought any more cockroaches. The time for buying them, we thought, was when we were selling the tech stocks, so of taking profits in some of the tech stocks, which was... Um, the middle of last year. Um, the one area of the portfolio that's got bigger because of the Russian crisis is our commodity exposure. Um, now, we always have an issue with the environmental impact of these companies. We try to buy the best quality mining companies we can, but we, we've we always felt that the energy transition we think the world needs to a low carbon future will require um, industrial minerals, particularly copper mining. And we haven't felt that owning none of these is more green than owning them. You know, we're, we're a believer in being pragmatic, recognizing the resources you need. And of course, the, uh, the, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine cuts down the amount of exports of an, a range of commodities. So our mining stocks have become eight or nine percent of the portfolio, but they're, they're quite volatile. Uh, so that's enough for us. And they've gone up quite a lot because of this invasion. We also own uh, companies like potash producers in, in Canada because the wheat price has gone up. So people will need more food uh, and, we, and we don't have an issue about investing in that side. Across the rest of our portfolio, we, we've tried to check and we're keeping a very beady eye on how companies behave. Um, there have been some high profile companies who said they're putting out of Russia and there have been an awful lot of companies who've said nothing so far. Uh, so we, we intend to follow that up with the companies and ask them what their attitude is. Uh, because these social obligations are very important to us as custodians of you know, our investors' wealth. Um, we want to know what position our companies are taking and why. Um, so um, environmental concerns, political concerns, uh, the one other aspect of this, we've never invested in Russia, by the way. We said we never would ever since we launched our unit trust 11 years ago now. Um, but we also have no money in China at the moment because we think they're in a very difficult position. So, again, we're, we're very conservative in terms of political risk at times like this. A key characteristic that you look for is pricing power. Has that become more of a focus at the moment, given the high inflation levels? And could you name a couple of stock examples that are inflation proof? Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, these cockroaches tend to be inflation, uh, good at passing on inflation or have proven track records of it. Yes, the risky thing at times like this is that most companies claim that they're good at passing on inflation. They say we've got terribly good businesses. Um, and then you wait and see their results and notice their margins are going down. <laughs> you know, you might have some sales growth, but actually the profits for shareholders go down. Then you can find yourself caught in, the, in a share which suddenly looks very expensive and you thought was cheap. Um, but companies like phone companies tend to have deals with their regulator, which allows them to put the price of um, phone calls or, or broadband up. I think most of us have had a letter from our broadband <laughs> provider already. They're the first to send out letters, them and also um, cable TV operators, pretty quick at putting the prices up. They actually don't face much cost inflation, these companies, but they're very good at getting uh, that through. So that's that's one of the reasons why those co that part of the cockroaches works well uh, and has good barriers to entry from that point of view, has good pricing power. American railroads, again, are not British railroads. This is where there's a big difference. Extremely good at passing on price increases and cost increases. Uh, and so those stocks have um, performed very well because the American investors can see that they're the sort of companies that have this strong pricing power in times of inflation. Thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Do check out the rest of our video series on our YouTube channel. And please do give us a like and subscribe. We'll see you next time.